Well, this morning we're going to look at, as I've already mentioned, thankfulness, specifically regarding the Lord's mercy towards us. And this topic of thanksgiving and the Lord's mercy could go on. You could preach on this for probably a year and still not exhaust it. Um, so this morning is going to be an attempt to do a condensed version. And I want to make... Uh, the point that mercy and grace are two very different things. They're very similar, and they go hand in hand, but they are different. And this morning, we've been looking at in the past number of weeks on our need and the Lord meeting it. And I felt that this was a good transition uh, from that topic in that we've seen how the Lord will is more than willing and able to meet our needs. And um, now... We're going to look at our thankfulness for him doing that. And the distinction between mercy and grace, in essence, is this. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Did you catch that? Mercy is not getting what you deserve. In other words, to put it a different way, in our, in our context of our Christian faith, it's not receiving the judgment that we so deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. So, in other words, it's receiving a blessing that you don't really deserve. Mercy is sparing you from something that you do deserve, which in our case is what? Hell. Grace is getting what we really don't deserve, which would be what? Heaven. Or Christ and all that goes along with it. First thing we're going to look at, and I'm going to quote a lot of scripture today, don't feel obligated to turn there, but the first thing we're going to look at is Mercy, in that the Lord has saved us from judgment. How many of you know that all have sinned and fall short? And I think I think that's a very good verse in that we all look at that in, in past tense. Everybody sinned and they've fallen short, but that's not what it says. It says that all have sinned and what? Fall. Fall. That's a present tense. And I would venture to say even a future tense. We are falling short every day. If you're not in that group, go ahead and raise your hand, and I'll talk to you after service. I know I am. <laughs> we all fall short daily to some degree, whether big or small. And in Psalms 103, verse 10, and I read this already in the opening of service, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor has He rewarded us according to our iniquities. That is the essence of mercy. That is not getting what we really deserve. Ezra 9.13 says, I love this verse. What has happened to us is a result of our evil deeds and our great guilt. I'll stop right there for a moment. Have you ever been in a point in your life where you're in a real fix and you're in a real mess? And if you're honest with yourself, you thought, man, I made my own bed and now I'm lying in it. I know I've been there a lot. It's kind of what he's saying here. What has happened to us is a result not of some external circumstance, not as a result of someone else. It's a result of us and our evil deeds and our great guilt. But listen to this. And yet, and yet, there's the caveat. Our God, you have punished us less than our sins deserved and, has, and have given us a remnant like this. Is that something to be thankful for? Now would be a good time to say amen. If the only mercy, now you've heard me say this before, if the only mercy God ever shows to us is simply saving us from hell. I, I, I shouldn't even say simply. It's, that's, it's not simply. But if that's the only thing he ever did, was to save us from hell and our sins, then that would be enough to thank him for how long? Eternity. Forever. Unendingly. But, here's the, here's the wonderful thing about God. Remember, remember that part where Paul says, and not only that, he's talking about God's blessings. I don't remember the exact, the exact reference, scripture reference, but he says, and not only that, it's like he's laid out all these wonderful things that God has saved us from sin and, and, and from judgment. And then he says, but not only that, there's more. And that's kind of what this is. But not only has he saved us from hell and judgment and shown us mercy in that regard, his mercy is not a one-time act. It's not a one-time thing that we receive once. It's a daily routine for the Lord. Meeting our needs and showing us mercy is a daily routine for God. Because in Lamentations 3, 22 through 23, it says, we sang this, the steadfast of the Lord, what? 
never, it never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Because they were a one-time thing. No, it says, because they are new when? Every day, every morning. Great is his faithfulness. His mercy has been shown in spite of our sins. And how many of you know mercy, you only need mercy if you deserve judgment, right? I don't know how many of you remember some months ago when I preached on, on the attribute of mercy. I quoted the story about Napoleon and how there was a man that had done criminal acts and he was sentenced to die. And the mother, do you remember this story? The mother came and pleaded for his mercy and he, for mercy from Napoleon. And he said, well, your son doesn't deserve mercy. He deserves he deserves punishment. And she said, but that's why he needs mercy. Right? That's why we need mercy, because we are sinners. And because in spite of our sins, the Lord has shown his mercy to us. Isaiah 43, verses 24 through 25, it says, this is the Lord talking. You have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. It's verse 24. Think about that. Think about what he's saying. This is the Lord. You have burdened me with your sins, and you have wearied me with your iniquities. Does that ever sound like you? I know it sounds like me a lot. Lord, here I am again over the same issue that I've struggled with all these years, repenting again. I'm burdening you again. I mean, that's incredible that the Lord says that, that you have wearied me. I'm tired <laughs> of your sin. But listen to this. He doesn't stop there. He says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. I will not remember your sins. I want you to stop and think for a moment. Don't dwell on this too long. But think of your worst besetting sin. Think maybe of a time in your life where you really failed God. You really messed up. Stop and think for a moment. I can. I don't have to think very long. What's that? That verse goes. I hear the accuser or deals that done. I know them well. And how many more? A thousand more. We know who we are. You know, Satan comes and says, "Well, you've done this." It's like, hey, I've done a lot more than that. Trust me. And we can all think of things that we struggle with daily, weekly, possibly yearly. I know I can. And sometimes it's. It's like we were talking about last week. It's embarrassing to come before the Lord and put those things in his hand. Lord, here I am again of the same issue, struggling over the same thing. This is the umpteenth time that I've repented about this. But now I want you to stop and think for a moment of the most intense meeting with God that you've ever had. A time where you've really felt his presence in a possibly a tangible way, so to speak. Think of the times that you've been really and truly blessed by him. All right? So on one hand, we have our worst besetting sin, our worst failure. Think of David. It's a good example. All right? Guy murders, commits adultery. That's pretty bad failure, I'd say. All right? What's he say? Cast me not away from your presence. But here's the thing. Think of David's life just for a moment. This isn't even in my notes, but as I'm thinking about this, Think of the blessings on God of uh, 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 excuse me the blessings of God on David's life before his sin, right? Well, God is what He inhabits just now, or the past and the present too, right? He's the God of eternity. He doesn't just know the here and now. He knows what's going to happen long before it ever happens. And in David's life, there's tremendous amounts of blessings and anointings on his life before he ever sinned. God blessed him knowing he was going to have a huge failure. Let's apply that to what we just talked about in our lives. The worst besetting sin you've ever had, the worst failure you've ever had, and then think about the biggest blessings from God you've ever had and the, the best anointing of God you've ever had. God anointed your life, blessed your life, knowing that you were going to commit those failures or knowing that you had committed those failures. That's mercy. He doesn't say, well, you know what? That's the end of that. You messed up so bad. There's no, there's, no, there's no blessing for you anymore. There's no more ability for me to touch you, to meet your need. He says, if you come to me and you confess your sins, guess what? I am faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So much so that I'm going to blot out your transgressions 
And what does he say? In Isaiah, I won't even remember your sins. That's a merciful God. The Lord came to us with our, his presence and gave us his blessing, even though he knew that we had or were going to commit great failures and sin. There's been times in my life that's really ministered to me. I, that, that's, that thought's not original to me. I heard it from my oldest brother one time. We were just talking, and I was really struggling with the blessing of God and, and not receiving it. And he made that statement that basically that, in essence, God blesses you or doesn't bless you not solely on the fact that you have sinned or are going to. He already knows these things, yet he's blessed you anyway. So you can't always look at a trial as like, well, I've sinned and God just hammered me. That is not to say, all this is not to say that we should just go ahead and sin. What does Paul say? Shall we sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. But it is to say that God is still merciful in spite of our sin. That is the mercy of God and one of the many reasons that we should have no problem, no problem being thankful and continually expressing it. Think of that word express and what it means. We're going to talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. So God is not only merciful in saving us from judgment, but he's also merciful in his provision. Psalm 80, Psalms 84 Verse 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing. Think about that. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Philippians 4.19 And my God will supply some of your need. My God will supply all, every need of yours, according to to his riches and glory in Jesus Christ. Think of that. I, I love that word in the scripture, according. He says that a lot. According. Think of that. According to what? His rich, how, how rich is the Lord in blessing and greatness? We can't even, our, our minds can't even comprehend that. And what does he say here? I'm going to supply your need, not according to man's knowledge, but according to my riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That's an awesome thing. As we talk about all these wonderful things, keep, in the con keep this in the context of thankfulness. And here's the thing. Our thankfulness for his mercy should translate into meaningful ways. All throughout my life, a Christian, oh, you, know, you, you, you hear this thought of thankfulness to the Lord. But you meet Christians, and sometimes it's kind of difficult to see them as, to, to, to think of them in the context of thankful. Because nothing about them and their attitude exudes thankfulness. Quite the opposite, actually. And I think we can all say we've fallen in that category at times. And it's not enough to just think in your mind that, oh, I'm just so thankful. I'm just very thankful for all the things the Lord's done. And think that in your head. That has to translate into meaningful ways, not just thoughts. And that is part of it, and we're going to see here about the meditation, but some of the ways that our thankfulness translates into is praise, which is the first thing we're going to look at, meditation, which like I said is, is part of it, dwelling on the riches of God, meditating, and also showing mercy to others. Not only our meditation and our thoughts, but our actions. First one we're going to look at, and we're going to spend a few moments here, more than the other others, praise. Thankfulness is something that has to be expressed, not only thought about. If someone invites you over, if you invited me over to your home for a meal or a time of fellowship, and you served me, and you did all this stuff, and you really went out of your way, you really put on a doozy of a meal, like Sister Karen does a lot of times, and I walked out and said, okay, have a good night, and never said a word, that's kind of rude, Right? What's the, pro what's the problem with what I'm saying? Or, or what should I say? What's the problem with what I'm not saying? I'm not showing my gratitude. I may be filled with thankfulness. Right? If someone does something kind for you, think, it could be anything. Think of things that people have done for you that were really gracious and merciful and, 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 and kind. Did you say thank you? I would, I would hope most of us did or do. That's kind of the polite thing to do. But beyond even being polite... 
It's the right thing to do. Put that in the context now of the Lord. Oh, I'm just so thankful. Imagine in your heart, Lord, I'm just so thankful. But you never say it. There's a problem with that because in Psalms 107, 1 through 2, it says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, which I think most Christians would say, Oh, I do that. I give thanks. For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. But get this, let the redeemed of the Lord do what? Think about it? Meditate on it? Is that what it says? Anybody know the rest of that verse? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say so. so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Express it. Don't just think about it. Whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Because the mercy of God should cause us, like we were singing about today, it should cause us to be glad and rejoice. And if you're really excited about something, and I know I'm a little more talkative maybe than most, that's probably why I'm up here this morning, but when I'm really excited about something, and I think a few of you know what excites me, I'm more than willing to share it with you. Boy, if I get an open ear, I'm going to tell you about it. And I'm, you're going to see just like right now, I'm thinking about it. What, what do you think it is? Hunting. I love to bow hunt. Right? And I, I was fortunate. I killed this big bull elk this past year. And boy, I'll tell you, at work, I'm whipping out my phone and showing pictures and sending emails. Boy, I, let me tell you what. The successful hunter was saying so. He was happy. He was excited. My face showed it. My expression showed it. My emotion showed it. And guess what? My words showed it. Right? Think of it and put that in any context of your life, something that you enjoy. When you start talking to somebody somebody about something that you're excited about, what do you do? You brighten up, you get happy, and you, boy, you have no problem verbalizing it. That's how we need to be in our thankfulness regarding the Lord's mercy. It should cause us to be excited, to brighten up, to smile, to be excited, to be exuberant, and to be able to verbalize it. Not just meditate on it. And remember, we're going to look at this in just a moment. I'm not saying that we should not meditate on it, but it shouldn't just stop there. And that's the problem in the body of Christ with a lot of us in the body is that we stop with the meditation. We don't then allow it to come out. The Bible talks about rivers of water coming out of us. Psalms 511, in keeping with this, it says, remember we're talking about praise in regards to Thanksgiving. Psalm 511 says, but let all, not some, not only the people that are really extroverted. It says, let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. I'm going to ask you a question this morning. Do you, are you one who takes refuge in the Lord? Are you redeemed? If you are, the Bible says to say so. And it also says, be glad, but don't just be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. There's a lot of different ways we can show our thanksgiving. Surely meditation is one of them. Verbalizing it is another, telling others about it. But praise is a big, an important part of that. I believe that the Lord has ordained praise as one of the main methods that we can offer up our praise to him. What, is the, what does the Bible say? It says, the sacrifices of what? Praise. In, Old, in the Old Testament, they would offer up, their, their sign of thanks and trust in the Lord was to go kill a lamb or a goat or whatever and offer it as a sacrifice. But as a New Testament believer and Christian, what is our sacrifice? Praise. Verbalizing it. Saying so. Being glad and rejoicing. But you go to a lot of churches. I've been in them. And there's times I feel like this. People come before the Lord and it's just this sour look it's like they'd rather be anywhere else but there, according to their expression. Now, maybe inside, they're just oozing with thankfulness. But I'd venture to say if that were really true, it would start coming out. It would show. They would talk about it. Psalms 32.11 says, and I want you to think of this before I read this. These are not requests. So often we read, especially the Psalms, and we think, man, that's really wonderful. They're not, he's not asking us to do this, though. The, the you is understood here, right? So when in Psalms 32, 11, it says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones. It, he's saying you, all you who are righteous, guess what? Be glad and rejoice. But not only that, listen to this, and shout, 
shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. If you're not getting the picture here, the Bible's making very clear that our, our gladness and our rejoicing and our thanksgiving for God's mercy and all of his benefits and blessings should be something that comes out of us, not just stays in us. Psalms 33.1 says, Sing for joy in the Lord. You righteous ones, praise, listen to this, praise is becoming to the upright. Think of someone who's just really sour all the time. Is that becoming? Not really. It's not something I personally like to be around. And unfortunately, I have to say, especially when I, I, I'm on alternating shifts at work. So I work two days or two weeks of morning, eight to four, two weeks of four to midnight. And I can stay up with the owls. I got no problem staying up till the wee hours. Boy, you asked me to get up early in the morning, and I am not a happy camper. And I can't tell you how many times, and this is to my shame, I'll go to work and somebody goes, man, what, what's, are you okay today? What's the matter with you? Uh, it's early. I don't want to be here. I'm in a bad mood. Well, nobody likes to be around that. It's just kind of like I have this black cloud hanging around me. Basically, they might as well have a sign. Stay away from me. I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> but that's not how we're to be as Christians. We're supposed to have praise, which is becoming of the people who are upright. Psalm 70 verse 4 says, let all, there's that word all again, let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you and let those who love your salvation, is that you today? Do you love the Lord's salvation? Say, there's that say word again, say continually, not just once in a blue moon, let them say continually, let God be magnified verbalizing our thanks. The psalmist, psalms go to great lengths to bring this out. Shout for joy. Make a loud noise. This is an important part of our spiritual walk. Praise is one of the main expressions of thanksgiving we can offer the Lord. And you can add prayer to that list. You can add all sorts of things. And I'm not, I'm not please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's the only method and the only way, but it is a very important way. And I believe that as Christians, we have failed in that area many times to make sure that praise is something that is becoming us, that, it, that we're offering it with rejoicing and thanksgiving. Psalms 92 verse 1 says, I like this, listen to this, how he opens it. A psalm, a song for the Sabbath, the holy day, right? Isn't that, we're meeting on Sunday, the holy day, the Sabbath, setting this apart from all other days to meet with the Lord. A song for the Sabbath, it is good to give thanks to the Lord and stop there. No, he says, this is for a song for Sunday. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and, and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. That's a good thing. It's becoming of the upright. All throughout the Psalms, and I encourage you, go ahead and do, and do a study on this on your own. All throughout the Psalms, praise and thanksgiving are inextricably linked. They're inextricably linked. You, can't, you, you basically can't separate the two. And moving on from that, so I think I've laid a pretty good groundwork for that. Now let's talk about the meditation part. Psalms 19 verse 14 says, Let the words of my mouth, so oh, there's that, that talking, that expressing thing again, but not only the words of my mouth, also and the meditation of my heart. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Psalms 49, verse 3. My mouth shall speak of your wisdom and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. Psalm 104, 34. My meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. So often for myself, the stresses of life are weighing me down when I come to church. And there are days, and some, some days it's really easy to come and verbally express my thanksgiving and praise. Boy, I had a great week. The blessing of the Lord was really upon my life. I didn't fall into a bunch of sin. But boy, those weeks where I was falling a bunch, more than I was walking, this past, I'm sure Justice made a point to tell all you, we went, we took her ice skating, was it two days ago? And boy, she, she, they got the little things they push around. And I'm trying my best to teach her, but telling a five-year-old how to do stuff is pretty much impossible and she's falling and falling and falling. I mean she fell more than she skated right that's us sometimes seems like we fall more than we run after the Lord but 
when we come before the Lord, we can't let that weigh us down. And when we think about the meditations of our heart that are sweet, the psalm says, again, that should just translate into our expression and our words and our praise. It should just be, they're, they're inextricably linked. Meditation, thinking about the wonderful things of the Lord. You know, I've heard, had someone say before, you know, if I, if I don't want to clap, if I don't want to raise my hands, and, and I don't really want to be, basically what they're saying was, if I don't really want to worship, it's not, it's not in my heart, therefore, why should I, basically, I shouldn't do it, because it's, it, what they were, in essence, saying was, it, it's fake, it's not genuine. But apply that to any other area of Christianity. I don't want to pray today, because I'm just not feeling it. It won't be genuine. I don't want to read my Bible because, you know, I really don't like reading. This actually applies to me. I don't like reading. <laughs> Unless it's about hunting, of course. But I, it, it, sitting down and reading, you know, let's just sit down and read the book of Isaiah. It just doesn't really, you know, it do, doesn't do it for me like it does for some people. It's not one of my gifts or, or maybe callings, but it's still required of the Lord, right? It's still I have to still be obedient. And sometimes that's all it is. It's just simple, pure obedience. Not only should our meditation be there, but also our verbalization. And now let's look at the third one I mentioned. Showing mercy to others. Colossians 3 tells us to forgive as the Lord forgave you. Think about that. How much has the Lord forgiven you? How much mercy has he shown to you? Enough that it saved you from hell. And not only that, it's new every morning. It never stops. It's unceasing. I would say this is a prime example of the phrase paying it forward. If we've been forgiven such a great, seeing as we have been forgiven such a great debt, so ought we to forgive those around us, right? And show mercy to them. I won't read the story, but I think most of you probably know the story of the unforgiving servant. He goes to the king. He owes what, I think it was $10 million in today's money. That's a lot of, that's a lot of coin, as people like to say. That's a lot of Benjamins. And he goes to the king thinking he's going to be thrown in jail, sold as a slave, his family. That's how they did things back then. What does the king do? He wipes away his debt. Mark paid on his debt, on his bill. That's awesome. That's us. We owe a debt that we couldn't pay, right? That's this guy. He couldn't pay that debt. How are you going to pay a debt from prison? It's impossible. It can't happen. That's eternal judgment. That's us. But immediately, it says immediately following this, what does this guy go do? You know... I, can't, I almost can't fathom this in the context of the story, but when you apply it to our lives, we do this all the time. It seems real silly in this story, but we do this consistently. He thinks to himself, you know, Joe Schmo over there owes me 10 bucks. I'm going to go get my money from this guy. What does he say? He says he grabs him by the neck and drags him off to prison so that he can get his money, which again, how are you gonna, how are you gonna, how's the guy going to pay you back from prison? So he's been forgiven $10 million and he goes and grabs his buddy around the neck, drags him off to prison over 10 bucks. What's, this, what's it say? And the king heard of this. He was exceedingly angry. Right? Think of that in our lives. The Lord has been merciful to us in forgiving us a debt that we could never pay. And then time and again, and we're all in this boat, someone offends us, someone does something, and I've talked about this before, I'm not, make, I'm not even saying that there are many times where the person wasn't in the wrong. Doesn't mean that they were right. He still owed the guy 10 bucks. Now, compared to 10 million, that's nothing. But he did owe. And there are people who have truly, legitimately offend us and make it hard for us to be merciful to them. But to whom receives mercy, what do they have to do? What's, what's the stipulation on receiving mercy and forgiveness? Giving it. Right? We have to give it. Especially, like he says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Think of that word according that we talked about earlier. According, how, how, how has the Lord forgiven you? A debt you can never pay. Well, that should be make it real easy for you to forgive and show mercy to other people. And if you're truly thankful for the mercy the Lord's given you, you're going to meditate on it. It's going to come out through your praise, your worship, and the words that you say, and your emotions. And you're going to show it to others. Those are the three signs, and I think you can come up with a list of others, but those are three 
signs that you are thankful for the mercy of the Lord. We're going to move on for just a moment. Our thankfulness for God's mercies should not only be te- de- excuse me. Our thankfulness for God's mercies should not only be dependent on our present circumstances. And I would say this applies to the good and the bad. It's very easy to have thankfulness in our hearts when things are going well. But it's a little harder when you're in Job's situation. Think about him for a minute. Guy had ten children taken away. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this in that story that when the servant says that, the, that his camels were all killed in the servants or whatever they were, the donkeys, the sheep, there's like three or four different guys that come up to him. And it says, and while he was still speaking, while he was still speaking, this servant comes up and says, oh yeah, all your, all your sheep are gone. And while he was still speaking, this servant comes up to him and says, oh yeah, all your oxen have been killed and the servants along with him. And while he was still speaking, a servant comes and says, your children were eating and drinking in their house. And a whirlwind came, collapsed the house, and all your kids are dead. Talk about a bear, bearers of bad news. What does it say? Job says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And one of my favorite verses in all scripture says, in all this, Job did not sin with his mouth or charge God foolishly. Why? Because Job recognized that the thankfulness for the mercies of God isn't dependent on our present circumstances. I believe the Lord, well, they say that Job was like the first book of the Bible written. And I think there's a reason for that. Because that applies very much to our day, day-to-day lives. Do we charge God foolishly? Do we sin with our mouth? When things are going well, it's pretty easy to be thankful. But are we showing that? Are we expressing that? Are we brightened? Are we, are, are we happy? Are we rejoicing when things are going bad? Well, if it's not... That's a problem because in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 it says, In everything, in all things, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, concerning me. That's God's will, to give thanks in all things. And when things are going good, we better not forget who the source of all that is. What did I say last week? The blessing of God is what? Our greatest asset. And sometimes it's get pretty easy to kind of uh, pat ourselves on the back. I did good. It's an easy thing to do. Well, in all things, good or bad, we got to give thanks. I read a statement that I love. Life is hard, but God is good. Life is hard, but God is good. God is good always. Mercy is also not something that we should only expect but something that we should be asking for. We so often think, well, it's just an automatic. I'm a king's kid. And part of being a king's kid is we get blessed and we get mercy, right? Well, that is true, but we should still ask for it because let me read you a few scriptures. Psalms 4 verse 1, it says, Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. The psalmist, the, 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 the people who wrote the psalms didn't think it was just an automatic. He says, have mercy on me and hear my prayer. Psalm 6, verse 2 says, have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. Psalms 51, verse 1, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. The psalmist doesn't stop here and say, you know what, Lord? You said that you're going to blot out my transgressions. You said that you won't remember my sins. So, thanks. No, he says, he asks for it. He says, have mercy He's pleading. He's entreating the Lord. Have mercy upon me. Blot out my transgressions. I'm asking you. One of the things about asking for mercy is it is a wonderful opportunity to humble yourself. Think about the many recipients of Jesus' miracles that we've been looking at recently. And what did it always start with? Think of Bartimaeus that we looked at recently. What did he start his petition with? Jesus, thou son of David, what? Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Many, many people, the, the, the woman whose, whose child was demon-possessed, have mercy on me, O Lord. It wasn't an, an assumed automatic thing. It was a requested thing. Something they were asking for. Because it is a great act of humility to those who receive it. And to those who ask for mercy, what have we been looking at? If you have no need, you have no need, right? But if you have need, 
then the Lord can touch your life. Those who ask for mercy are acknowledging, Lord, I need it. Mercy isn't for those people who don't need it. It's for those people who do. Everyone does, but it's only going to be given to those who actually ask for it, who acknowledge that they need it. What a wonderful thing to humble ourselves and say, Lord, I need your mercy. I need it today. Mercy is who God is. It's his DNA. It's the essence of God. The wonderful part is God's not a cheapskate when it comes to mercy. Ephesians 2 verse 4 says, but God who is poor in mercy? No, it says God who is rich, rich in mercy because of his great love. Think of those adjectives. He's rich. He's great in love with which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. First Peter 1 verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant, abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Psalms 86, 15, But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious long-suffering and, not only that, abundant in mercy and in truth. What did we talk about last week? What did I say? God is the God of what? Abundance. God doesn't do things on a small level. He likes to do things on a really grand scale. He's, he's able to send the 12 out and do some miracles, but he's also able to feed the ten to 20,000 hungry people that come there out of just five loaves and two small fish. He's the God of abundance. And not only did he feed them, what did we see? There was 12 baskets left over. He's going to give a doggy bag to all of his waiters. He's the God of abundance. And he's not only abundant in loving kindness and long-suffering and compassion, he's abundant in mercy. All these scriptures that we've looked at, I think that should cause thankfulness to rise up within us. It should be an easy thing to show it. Think of if you were hanging, I'm sure you've heard this analogy before, if you're hanging on a cliff, the branches are cracking, you're ready to fall a couple hundred feet to the rocks below, and someone lowers down a rope and saves you, what do you think you're going to do when you get to the top? Hey, have a nice day. Walk away? No, you're going to be making a pretty big point to show how thankful for you are that they saved your life. If your car is stranded in the middle of the train tracks, and the big old train is barreling down on you, and you're about ready to get smashed into smithereens, and someone comes out and your door is locked and you can't get it open, someone comes over, smashes your window, pulls you out just as that train runs through your car and you would have been dead. Are you going to express it? Is it going to well? Is your thanksgiving for that person's mercy and kindness going to come out? I would think so. But the person who saved us from hell, so often we just keep that internalized. That shouldn't be the way that we operate, saints. It should be over full to overflowing. God is abundant in mercy towards us, but guess what? We should be abundant in thanksgiving to him. Did you catch that? He's abundant in mercy to us. It should be more than easy to be abundant in thanksgiving to him. In conclusion today, his mercy is available to all, but here's the wonderful thing. It's especially available to those who are his. Because in Psalms 33, Verse 18, it says, Behold, the eye of the Lord. I love when Scripture says that. The eye of the Lord is on those who fear Him. On those who hope, not assume, but those who hope in His mercy. Psalms 32, verse 10. He who trusts in the Lord, mercy, mercy shall surround him. In conclusion today, I want to ask you, are you part of the company of people who fear him? Do you trust him? Because if you are, if you're a person who fears him, you're a person who trusts him, the Bible says, his mercy is going to surround you. Are you thankful for his mercy in saving you? It's really easy to take, again, that, that's an assumed thing, that's a, that's a very taken for granted thing to those who are mature in the faith. 
we've been saved and then we want to start maturing and seeking after the deep things and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But we can't forget where we came from. And when we think and meditate on the Lord's mercy and the fact that he has met our needs, thanksgiving should just be easy for us. May we not hold back our praise for him or be silent in our thanks. But rather, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen? Go ahead and stand with me this morning. You take that hand out that I gave you. This morning, as we looked at this thought of mercy and thanksgiving, may our hearts be full of thanksgiving for the mercies of God that have been shown to us. Because guess what? We who are the children of God can say with the psalmist, think about this, is this you today? Are you a child of God? Can you say this? If you're saved, you can. It's a rhetorical question. Surely goodness and mercy have followed us all the days of our lives. Amen. This morning, I want to read out loud a portion of Psalms 136 together. Starting with verse 1. Read with me. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For His mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for His mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of the lords, for His mercy endures forever. To Him alone who does great wonders, for His mercy endures forever. To Him who by wisdom made the heavens, for His mercy endures forever. To Him who laid out the earth above the waters, for His mercy endures forever. To Him who made great lights, for His mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for His mercy endures forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for His mercy endures forever. To Him who led His people through the wilderness, for His mercy endures forever. Who remembered us in our lowly state, for His mercy endures forever. And rescued us from our enemies, for His mercy endures forever. Who gives food to all flesh, for His mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven, for His mercy endures forever. Amen. Lord, we declare to you today that we are thankful for your mercy. Lord, we are thankful that they are not just a one-time act, but they are new again every day, every morning. Lord, teach us to meditate on your mercies, to verbalize it through praise and thanksgiving, and to show it to others, considering we have been forgiven so great a debt. Lord, let not the basic things of our salvation become taken for granted in our walk, Lord. But we ask, Father, that your mercy would be something that is real and alive to us. That, Lord, we would become excited about the mercy that we've been shown and thankful, Lord. That it would always translate in, into thankfulness and expression of that thankfulness. Lord, truly, we do put our hope in you. We put our trust in you. And Lord, you said that those who fear you, your mercy will surround them. And Lord, we ask that you would teach us to fear you and that your mercy would surround us this week, this month, this year. That we would be those who trust not in the arm of the flesh, but in the mercies of our God, who is abundant and rich in mercy. We thank you, Lord, for these things. We thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together in worship expressing our thankfulness. We thank you for this time we've been able to look at the wonderful word that you have given us. We pray, Lord, now that you would bind it to our hearts and use it to change our lives, our way of thinking, our way of living. And Lord, that in all that we do and say, you would be honored and glorified. We ask all this in your name.